Okay, I am here with uh, Chris Date and Sam Adams, who I think has the absolute best name. Uh, <laughs> I, honestly, though, I'm a little disappointed that it's not like the Sam Adams, but he's been dead for a few hundred years. So, um, but uh, thank you, Sam, for being on the show. Thank you, Chris, for being on Theology in the Raw to have this uh, uh, important conversation. I mean, we're talking about some really uh, fundamental aspects of, let's just say, historic Christianity. So, uh, Chris, why don't you just start by giving us a few uh, words about who you are, um, and uh, we'll, we'll toss it over to Sam, and then we'll jump into the conversation. Sure. It's, it's difficult for me to do just about anything in two or three minutes, but I'll do my best. Um, <laughs> I uh, am a husband and father of four boys, ranging in age from six to 18. My wife and I have been married for almost 20 years. Uh, we live in the Pacific Northwest. And when we married, we were both atheists, but shortly after the birth of our first child, or maybe it was shortly before. Anyway, I became a believer. And then a few years later, by God's grace, he did as well. Um, I've been a software engineer my entire adult life. That's my career, but it's not what I'm most passionate about. I'm good at it. It makes a crap ton of money, but I'm not, it's not what I'm passionate about. I would like to teach one day at the seminary level. I'd like to teach Bible and theology. And to that end, I uh, began an undergraduate in religion at Liberty University in 2014, from which I gradu graduated at the beginning of 2017. And then later that year, I began a master's of arts and theology at Fuller Seminary, which is what I'm wrapping up now, after which I hope to do an Old Testament PhD at somewhere like Cambridge or Oxford, uh, Durham, one of those top tier UK schools. Uh, I am most known for my work with Rethinking Hell. Uh, I am a sort of, I'm sort of the face of the conditionalist movement today, the, the, the movement of conditional immortality. Um, and I've published a couple of books and some journal articles in that regard. But recently, I've also been starting to dip my foot in the pool of Trinitarian theology, uh, Christology. Uh, and so uh, a number of months ago, I debated a Unitarian named Dale Tuggy uh, in person. And we are right now reviewing a second round of proofs from a publisher who's going to be publishing an expanded version of our debate. Uh, so hopefully that should be coming out soon. Um, and uh, I'm just increasingly becoming um, uh, interested in this particular area of theology as well. Uh, and, then, and, and then there's one other area of theology that I'm most known for, which is Reformed theology, Calvinism, predestination, meticulous providence, things like that. So um, yeah, I guess, that's, I guess that's me in a nutshell. There's probably a lot more I could say, but I'll stop there. You would be on the Reformed side of things, right? You would consider yourself Reformed? Very much so, yes. Okay. And I, I didn't pick you for wanted to do a PhD in Old Testament. That, that's, I don't think we've talked about this. No, well, so uh, there are a few reasons for that. Number one, the Old Testament is just way cooler than the new. You know, <laughs> I remember uh, in, in, I was taking a class in Aramaic at Fuller, huh. and we were going through, I think it was the book of Ezra, yeah. and um, there's this part where I was translating, and I wasn't familiar with the book of Ezra prior to this, and all of a sudden I started translating this king's command that if his if his if his if his decree was disobeyed he says let us let a beam be taken out of his house and let him be impaled on it and i was thinking that's cool that's fun to translate you don't get anything <laughs> like that in the new testament and then also i just I, I think way too many christians are they operate under this misapprehension that you can just land, you can drop the New Testament in someone's lap and they're going to be able to understand it. And there's certainly a degree to which that's true, but the Old Testament really is the fountain, you know, the wellspring from which the New Testament bursts forth. And I don't think that it can really be understood apart from a, a good understanding of the Old. And so for those two reasons and others, uh, the Old Testament is what I decided I wanted to do my specialty in. I want to ask you about your opinion on Andy Stanley's book. I know he's gotten some flap for uh, d uh, dismissing or uh, downgrading. Un un what does he say? Un unhitching the New Testament or the, the, the <laughs> gospel or Christianity from the Old Testament? Yeah, don't ask me because I won't have very many kind things I, to say. I, uh, I haven't read it and I don't like to comment on books I haven't read. But if, if, the, um, if the critiques are anywhere near the mark, I would, I would have a few words a word to say about that. <laughs> I, I don't know if you know... Um, Chris, but uh, I, I did my PhD in New Testament, but I've actually taught uh, Old Testament. Like that, I that didn't know my, that. Um, that's really my primary love. So, um, yeah. Well, um, you and I find you and I find more and more things that we have in common every, every day, don't we? <laughs> right, right. Um, I, I, oh shoot, are you there? I'm did still we, here. Yeah, he's still here. Okay, hmm? I 
Oh, there you are. Okay. So I, I clicked on something and now I can see you guys, but you're really small and up in the <laughs> top corner of my computer. So um, uh, anyway, all right. So I'm going <laughs> to, the, the show must go on and I don't want to yeah. delete this uh, episode right now. So I'm not going to click on too many things. Um, Sam, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, just some, yeah general facts about who you are i know we we got connected because we have a mutual friend luke thompson who who connected us uh really for this podcast but uh thank you so much for being on with yeah uh, tell tell us just a bit about your story sure yeah thank you for for having me preston and shout out to to luke for helping set this up um so i grew up in the chicago area um i grew up in a biblical unitarian church um but at the same time but my church was pretty small growing up um, so I also did sort of like youth group activities and summer camp and stuff like that and mainstream evangelical Trinitarian churches as well. So I sort of had like one foot on each side of the Unitarian Trinitarian divide growing up. Um, I went to college. I studied uh, statistics at Cornell. Um, and, uh, and then afterwards, I, uh, I worked as a a data scientist for a while and then got my degree from from Harvard University in statistics also and I work in in data science and machine learning in sort of the healthcare related industries um, but so I don't have any we were just talking about this I don't have any formal theological training myself but have been I guess you would say a highly engaged lay person and a lot of this has to do with um, like when I was in college, I, I went to, you know, Trinitarian churches and was involved with Trinitarian Christian fellowships on campus. And I was forced to step down from one uh, Christian fellowship because of my beliefs one time in college. And that was sort of a, a hard, difficult time that caused me to really sort of think about this subject kind of more intensely and more for my own than I ever had before. Um, and, and then later on, actually just about a year ago, I was excommunicated from uh, a local evangelical Trinitarian church for uh, volunteering for the worship band and having that uh, lead to a cascade of events that caused me to need to talk to the pastor about my beliefs. So this is one of those subjects that honestly I'm interested in almost by force and not by choice. It's one of those things that I can't uh, shake. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I'm sort of a, a thoughtful, curious person that, that likes to take these questions seriously. So, so I've spent a lot of time studying this topic and trying to understand it. And I would honestly even say there was a period of time where I was trying to convince myself to become a Trinitarian because that would have solved a lot of my social problems. But I failed to do so, I guess I might say. So, so that's sort of my background and how I got to here, I guess. Can I ask you just briefly, so you were raised in a, in a, in a Unitarian church. Yes. I've been in Trinitarian church churches. Why didn't you, why did you even explore like a Trinitarian church? Do you, do you resonate with the flavor of evangelicalism more than a Unitarian church? Or? So actually, I would say that my biblical Unitarian church growing up was evangelical. Okay. So this is, this is where well, I know that that idea might not be reciprocated, but but in my opinion, there's actually very little difference between most biblical Unitarian churches and kind of a standard evangelical Bible-oriented church uh, that you'd find anywhere else. They have some differences in their theology, of course, but in terms of practice and style and flavor and stuff like that, it's really very similar. Okay, interesting. Okay, well, um, uh, for my audience, um, what, I want, what I told uh, Chris and Sam ahead of time is that I would give... Uh, each one like 10 minutes to, to lay out kind of their position and then five minutes to respond to each other. And then we're just going to engage in a, in, a dial, in a dialogue and just see how that goes. Um, so, Chris, why don't you uh, start us off with your 10 minutes? And I do, I do have a clock here. I'm not going to be like a <laughs> clock Nazi, okay? I'm not going to, um, you know, the second it goes over 10 minutes, like throw the phone at you. It wouldn't it just break my computer anyway. But, um, but, but I do want to stay in, within the ballpark. So, Chris, why don't you kick us off with – uh, your your view of uh, Trinitarianism. Sounds good. The doctrine of the Trinity holds that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, but the Father, Son, and Spirit are eternally personal and distinct from one another. 
To use the historical jargon, the oneness of God describes God's being, substance, or essence, while the threeness of God describes the divine persons, hypostases, or subsistences. Put another way, God is one what and three whose. For nearly two millennia, Christians have debated just how this oneness and threeness of God is to be fleshed out, but I argue that person, in Trinitarian language, refers to the personal self, the possessor of being, the I who can speak of my body, my soul, my mind, or even my very being. Person, in this sense, is not numerically identical to being, but neither is it a concrete thing separable from being. Instead, person subsists in being. And to understand what it means for something to subsist in this way, consider the relationship between a husband and wife. The marital relation isn't a concrete thing. It has no being in and of itself. Rather, it subsists in the two beings so related. I contend that person, or the personal self, likewise subsists in being. Now, creatures are universally unipersonal, that is, one and only one person subsists in each created personal being. But this shouldn't dictate how we ought to think of God any more than the universal finitude and contingency of creatures means we should think of God as finite and contingent. No, he is infinite and necessary, or, or he has aseity, and he may therefore also be multipersonal, even if all creatures are unipersonal. So my position is that three distinct persons or personal selves subsist eternally in the one being of God. Now, I believe this for historical, biblical, and theological reasons, but since I don't have much time, I'll focus today on my biblical reasons, the most important of which is that the Bible teaches Jesus Christ is Yahweh incarnate, and yet he is eternally distinct from his Father. Dozens of texts teach this reality, but I prefer depth to breadth, and so I want to focus on just three. I'll begin with the so-called Carmen Christi, the Christ hymn in Philippians 2, 5-7, in which Paul writes, Christ Jesus was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. If I understand Sam correctly, he believes this passage refers solely to Jesus' earthly ministry. Though he could have exercised the divine authority granted him by his father, he instead humbly served his people rather than demand that his people serve him. This is a better Unitarian reading than that of some other Unitarians who think Paul is contrasting Jesus with Adam because Adam allegedly tried to attain equality with God, whereas Jesus did not. But this other Unitarian reading was thoroughly debunked over a hundred years ago, and one reason that it utterly fails to do justice to the text is because when Paul says Jesus didn't consider equality with God, something the ESV translates a thing to be grasped, this word actually means something to be taken advantage of or exploited, meaning that the son already possessed equality with God. And so Sam rightly thinks the son possessed this at the time he humbled himself. But there are, I think, several fatal flaws in Sam's reading. First, when Jews roughly contemporary to Paul, like Philo and Josephus, refer to the form of God, they use it to designate, designate what is distinctly divine, not merely authority or office, as I think Sam contends. Sam bases his reading in part on the notion that servant is a role or office, not something that has a distinctive essential ontology, as deity does. But taking the form of a servant is parallel to being born in the likeness of men, and humans do, in fact, have the essential nature of a servant to God. That is what they are created to be. The God whose nature is to rule became man whose nature is to serve. He who is Lord came as slave. Second, when likewise contemporary Jews refer to equality with God, they mean ontological equality, equality of very being. In John 5.18, for example, John says the Jews think Jesus is making himself equal with God, for which reason they seek to kill him. Philo says there's nothing equal to God. And as a thoroughgoingly Jewish Christian, Paul wouldn't have used such language of a creature. A third reason I don't think Sam's reading holds up under scrutiny is because it seems to require that likeness of men and human form refer specifically to ordinary humans in contrast to, say, a royal birth in the lap of luxury. But there's no adjective in the text and no other evidence that Paul is thinking only of certain kinds of humans. He simply has in mind Christ's birth as human, full stop. Thus, Paul also says in Galatians 4, 4, that God sent forth his son born of woman. And he says in Romans 8, 3, that God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Moreover, and fourthly, being born in the likeness of men is again parallel to taking the form of a servant. And these are participles of means, identifying the means by which Christ emptied himself. He did not count his equality with God something to exploit, but rather he emptied himself by becoming a human being. This is the remarkable humiliation Paul has in mind.
For these and other reasons, the early church read the passage in much the way I do, including Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Origen, and Novatian. Meanwhile, I haven't seen any early Christians reading the passage the way Sam does, but I'm open, I'm open to being shown to be wrong. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next, I want to look at Hebrews 1, 2-3, in which the author says that God has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Significantly, the author here credits the Son with participation in creation, despite surely being familiar with Old Testament texts like Isaiah 44, 24, which say Yahweh alone created the heavens and the earth. The author is here using language recognizably referring to the Genesis creation in saying the son participated. In chapters 12, verses 26 and 27, the author uses the verb poieo, here translated created, to call the heavens and earth things that have been made. This language is used the same way elsewhere in the New Testament and in the intertestamental literature. Furthermore, in chapter 11, verse 3, the author uses the same word here translated world to say the universe or world was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Now, that word world literally means the ages, but even if the author means to say the sun was involved in the creation of the ages and not the world, he does not have only present and future ages in mind. He says in chapter 9, verse 26, that Jesus appeared at the end of the ages, implying a succession of past ages are included as well. If the author thinks God created the ages through the sun, they nevertheless include all the ages, past, present, and future, making the sun Yahweh, the creator and God of Israel. Finally, I want to look at Matthew 23, 37 to 38, in which Jesus laments, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Now, this may not seem relevant to our debate today, but when protective bird imagery is used in the ancient Near East, it always concerns a deity. This is easily seen in ancient Near East iconography, in which gods are represented by the ubiquitous winged sun disk, often hovering protectively over royalty owing to the sun's lofty position in the heavens. Protective bird imagery also features in the Old Testament, in which every instance thereof refers to Yahweh's protection of Israel. This includes Deuteronomy 32, 11-12, Ruth 2, 12, Psalms 17, 8-9, 36-7, 51-1, 61-4, and 91-4. Nowhere is such imagery used to portray a creature. It is striking, then, that Jesus self-appropriates imagery his Jewish hearers would have associated exclusively with Yahweh, the Lord and his biographers, being familiar with ancient Near East iconography and steeped in the Hebrew scriptures, would have known of the avian metaphor's exclusive association with the divine, and they would not have haphazardly used it of an ordinary human being, or even some sort of exalted creature. In fact, Jesus also says he is leaving the temple desolate, in verse 38, and forsaken, in the parallel in Luke 13, 35, the same language Yahweh uses in the Septuagint translations of Jeremiah 12, 7, and 22, 5 to describe the state in which he judicially leaves the temple forsaken and desolate. Moreover, in context, Matthew places the lament immediately after the Lord promises to hold the scribes and Pharisees guilty for the murder of Israel's past prophets, which indicates that by claiming the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem has stymied his own frequent desire to gather the children of Israel, Jesus is referring to Yahweh's repeated attempts through history to reach the people through the prophets, which he says here were his own attempts. So let me sum up my case uh, to wrap things up. First, in Philippians 2, 5 to 7, Paul describes Jesus using language contemporary Jews reserved for God alone. And he says that Jesus emptied himself by becoming human, a clear affirmation of the doctrine of incarnation. Second, in Hebrews 1, 2 to 3, the author says the son participated in the Genesis creation or the creation of all time, thereby identifying Jesus as incarnate Yahweh, the creator and God of Israel. Third, in Matthew 23, 37 to 38, and its parallel in Luke 13, 34 to 35, Jesus self-appropriates protective bird imagery, which his hearers would have recognized as an unmistakable self-identification with the divine. Since at least two of these texts and a host of others make clear that the son is distinct from his father, the only logical conclusion is that God is multipersonal and that Jesus is incarnate Yahweh. It's only a small step further to accept that the Holy Spirit is likewise one of the divine persons, a step I'll substantiate during our open discussion if needed. Thank you. Chris, you're five.
four, three. <laughs> I'm known for being good with my yeah, time. <laughs> I've, I've, I've noticed that in your other debates that you are, you are very, uh, very efficient in like clockwork on your statements and your time allocation. I try. Your first rodeo, I guess. Um, and you didn't even mention the Gospel of John or Revelation. Is that intentional? I mean, I'm not sure we'll get into that, but. Um. Uh, well, just suffice it to say that I'm familiar with how Unitarians read a lot of texts that Christian that or that, that Trinitarians typically cite. Trinitarians typically cite dozens of texts and they just throw them out there and read them rather than exegete them. Uh, and Amen. so what I yeah, so what I prefer to do is to pick. Uh, these are what I think are the three most powerful texts, uh, which, when exegeted closely, simply don't make room for a Unitarian reading, in my opinion. And that's why I focus on them rather than take sort of a shotgun scattering approach. I don't think that's very helpful. Should I be embarrassed that I've never connected the, um, the Jesus- bird imagery? Yeah. I mean, no, I, not, I, I might argue no either, as but as we, as we can get to those. I was like, oh, yeah, I get that. But I've never considered that before. Should I, be, should I turn in my PhD right now? <laughs> no, 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 no. You actually don't hear a lot of Trinitarian scholars arguing this. You do see Simon Gathercole doing it, and I think he's right to do it for the reasons that I explained. Yeah. But no, you're not at all in a minority okay. of scholars in, in failing to make that connection. Man, what did I miss? That's like, yeah. <laughs> Although a lot of scholars do think that it's a reference to himself as divine wisdom. Um, um, and if you yeah. didn't know that, then maybe you should be ashamed of. <laughs> well, no, yeah, I'm, no, I'm kidding. Familiar with the wisdom uh, tradition, but um, well, thank you so much for that, Chris. Sure. Uh, and and yeah, we're gonna have time for counter response and dialogue. So, uh, Sam, why don't you take ten sure. minutes ish and, and unpack your view? Sure. First off, I'd really like to thank uh, Preston for hosting this dialogue. I know that many other people would have shied away from this topic, but I really admire your courage to foster open dialogue and follow follow the Bible where it leads. I'd also really like to thank Chris Date for engaging in this discussion with me. I admire Chris's work on the topic of hell and annihilationism. I recognize that he's a much uh, higher status person in the world of Christian apologetics and scholarship than I am, so I appreciate him for uh, condescending to engage with me. Um, One of the reasons that I want to talk with both of you is precisely because you've gone through the process of rethinking hell. I think both of you realize that the traditional majority doctrine of eternal conscious torment was actually a later addition to the Christian tradition that was heavily influenced by Greek culture and Neoplatonism and the philosophy of the church fathers. And that once you peeled back that influence, you could see back to an earlier, more Jewish and more contextually appropriate way of understanding things. So my point today will be to encourage you to follow that same analogy and the lessons you learned from Rethinking Hell to also re-examine what the Bible has to say about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, their identities and their relationships with each other. I think that what is now called biblical Unitarianism is a more accurate understanding of the biblical teachings on these subjects and that is more faithful to the beliefs taught and believed in by the apostles and most importantly Jesus himself. Um, Since many people listening will probably have never heard of biblical Unitarianism, I'll take some time to explain what it is. Um, First, something Chris Press and I all share is a commitment to the Bible as the divinely inspired word of God, and the Bible alone as the final authority of doctrine. I just wanted to make sure uh, that I was clear on that. Um, I consider myself an evangelical Christian, and most biblical Unitarians are, are virtually indistinguishable from mainstream American evangelicals in most other ways. Um, The difference is that biblical Unitarians believe that God is simply one person. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is a unipersonal God. He is named as Yahweh in the Old Testament, and he alone is God, and there is no other. Jesus is a man born of the Virgin Mary, the prophesied and long-awaited for Messiah of Israel, a man empowered by God to do many signs, wonders, and miracles, the Son of God, but not God himself. Before he was born, Jesus only existed in the mind and foreknowledge of God. Jesus was always going to be the most important man in God's plan for creation. In a grand and mysterious sense, all of creation and the whole arc of history is Christocentric. But in the most real sense, Jesus only began to exist when he was conceived of by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. Uh, Speaking of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not a person in the same sense that God and Jesus or you and I are. The Holy Spirit is the power and spirit of God, or perhaps something more like God's active energy and presence in creation, but it's not its own separate member of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit gave inspiration to the prophets in the Old Testament and has now been poured out on all flesh through the works of Jesus. Jesus. 
Um, to help show this theology and practice, I'll take some time to read parts of Acts chapter 2 and walk through how I would understand it. I think Acts 2 is one of the most important chapters in the Bible because it represents like the first gospel presentation that Peter himself is giving on the day of Pentecost. So jumping right into verse 22, men of Israel hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Okay, so my interpretation would be, you'll notice that God and Jesus are just clearly distinguished. I think everyone, Trinitarians included, intuitively understands that the God that's being referenced is the single person of God the Father. Peter just feels no need to clarify, and his Jewish audience would have already understood God to be one person, the Father. So or though they might not have called him the Father in that same way as referring to Jesus, but he doesn't take any time to clarify to his audience who he's talking about. It's the same person they already believe in. Jesus doesn't do miracles from his intrinsic power, but God does them through him. Jesus had, has always been part of the plan and foreknowledge, but he wasn't existing earlier. A question that I would have for Chris is exactly in what sense Jesus died. If Jesus was fully divine, how could his divinity allow him to die? If God were killed, who would raise him up? But God isn't killed. Rather, God is the one who raises Jesus up. Okay, continuing verse 32. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For God did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom he crucified. Okay, an extremely important theme throughout the New Testament is that Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of God. Yahweh can't receive a promotion. This only makes sense if Jesus is not God, but is rather someone exalted by God. Also notice that Jesus had to receive the promise of the Holy Spirit from God. Peter quotes Psalm 110, which is critically important. Chris states, states that Jesus is Yahweh, but here in Psalm 110, we see a prophetic vision of the Messiah sitting at Yahweh's right hand. I think that one source of confusion on the topic of the Trinity is the word Lord. In English and in Greek, the word Lord can refer to both God or a human being. And so I think it sort of blurs the distinction a little bit in people's minds and they interchange them in ways that are, can cause some confusion. But in Hebrew, this verse is actually quite clear and quite different. It reads, Yahweh said to my Adoni. Adoni is a word for human lords and is only ever used for humans. There's a related word Adonai, which can be either a human or a god, but Adoni is only ever referred to humans. Yahweh is clearly distinguished from his human Messiah. You can't both be Yahweh and sit at Yahweh's right hand in heaven. The psalm is also extremely important because it foreshadows Jesus' heavenly rule. Jesus is not God himself returning back to the heavens after a short period as a man, and said he is a newly exalted to reign alongside his father, and after being perfected through suffering and finishing the race his father set before him. This relates to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 23 through 28. Then the end will come when he, that is Jesus, hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who puts everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Notice how Paul goes out of his way to explain that God himself, which is an interesting phrase, is not subjected to Jesus, because for him that would be absurd. But instead, Jesus is subject to God in eternity after serving as God's active agent to subdue all powers and authorities unto God. How can God himself to be subject to anyone for eternity? For Paul, Jesus is not part of God himself. Rather, Jesus is a separate and unequal and subordinate self and person himself. All right, returning back to Acts 2, after Peter ends, in ser ends his sermon by mentioning that God has made the crucified and risen Jesus, Jesus both Lord and Christ, we learn that thousands of people became Christians that day. 
Another important topic for our discussion today is not just the relationship between God and Jesus, but also the question of what must be believed in in order to be saved. Um, from my intro, you, you heard that I'm perfectly happy to commune with Trinitarians and to count them as my brothers and sisters in Christ. I may think that they're mistaken, but not fatally so. I think they have the basics right. The basics that Peter preached in his sermon, that Jesus was a man who lived an honorable life, was wrongly crucified, died and was buried, then God raised him from the dead and has exalted him to his right hand from where he will return to judge the living and the dead. Trinitarians believe all these things, as do biblical Unitarians, as did the people who heard Peter's sermon that day. However, many Trinitarians that you uh, think that you have to believe additional things in order to be saved. Peter's teaching failed to communicate the core doctrines of the Trinity and the Incarnation. In fact, he seems to even contradict them. I ask you, if these things are required for Christian faith, why didn't Peter mention them? How then could thousands of people been saved that day? My contention is that Peter didn't teach them or believe in the Trinity, but instead had a specifically a different theology about those things. Many Trinitarians believe that the Trinity is an essential doctrine without which the entire edifice of theology would fall apart. It's like imagine as the base layer of a cake, and if you were to take that layer away, the whole cake would collapse. However, Christianity was not Trinitarian for centuries, and biblical Unitarians are living proof that that isn't true. I think of the Trinity as something like a fancy and clunky decoration that was added to the cake after it was already baked, and that really distracts more than it helps, and that the cake is best enjoyed without it. This is why I think these discussions are so important, but also difficult. There's a certain asymmetry in these discussions where biblical Unitarians treat Trinitarians as fellow Christians and try to engage in good dialogue, but the Trinitarians often don't return the favor and we get dismissed as heretics. This is also why I'm grateful to Preston and Chris today, because I hope we can get beyond this divide. I know both of you have experienced the cold-hearted stonewalling for believing in annihilationism. I also heard that you asked for, you know, nothing more than a seat at the table to be able to discuss your views and that you've spent so much time studying and analyzing them and that it, it can hurt to be treated with condescension and scorn. So I'm asking for the same from both of you and all the listeners out there today. Assume that I might have something to say that you haven't yet fully considered. Accept me as someone seeking nothing more or less than good faith dialogue about the word of God. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. Really appreciate that. And uh, how was my timing? I was wondering the same thing. Twenty-four seconds over your. your oh, okay. Is, All right. Uh, Ballpark. All right. Fail. This Fail. is my. This is my first rodeo. So. Uh. <laughs> I just want to say, I mean, to be accepted without ridicule or scorn. Uh, you know, I, I might have said this during my intro. I haven't recorded it yet for my audience. I, I record my intros after the podcast. So, um, but you know. I'm a big fan of exchanging ideas, humanizing each other and letting the evidence, you know, compete against each other. So no, I, I uh, really appreciate your posture and tone and, and your commitment to um, following the text where it leads. Um, e even if we end up walking away disagreeing, which I'm, I'm going to assume, is, you know, maybe may one of us will change our, our view in this moment. This would be really amazing, but probably not. But um, what I want to do is be able to have our audience hear a good, thoughtful, humble presentation of, of each view. Um, you keep using the phrase biblical Unitarianism. Is that to distinguish it, distinguish it, distinguish it from another kind of Unitarianism? Yes. We, we don't use the word biblical Unitarianism as an insult to Trinitarians. We use it as a way to distinguish ourselves from Unitarian Universalists who have often strayed away from the Bible and really any kind of form of Christianity whatsoever. And Unitarian Universalism is more common and more well heard of than Biblical Unitarianism. So the word biblical is, is against that side, not, not against you guys. And that's a specific denomination, right? Um, it's not actually a specific denomination. There are a collection of denominations kind of that have, many of them have independently come to the same conclusion. And there's also sort of a network of kind of small or house or independent churches who have sometimes had to break away from larger denominations over the subject. Okay. And, and back in like the early, you know, the late 1700s and early 1800s, back when Unitarianism was first becoming a big thing in the United States, there were conservative and kind of liberal elements to the movement. And, and so, you know, Unitarianism has had a long history in the United States, but for the most part, the liberals have uh, won in terms of numbers. So within the Unitarian movement, you, you would see yourself as kind of a minority 
uh, person by the fact that you are a biblical. Yes, we're a minority of a minority. Okay, well, <laughs> that's always fun. Just, just, uh, just to clarify something, although biblical Unitarians, so-called, and you know, we can talk about that later, but uh, although they're not a denomination, I do think that the Unitarian Universalists are, right? I mean, they've got- They, they are, yes, they are an actual denomination. Okay. That's right. Okay. 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 All right, Chris, do you want to give a five minute response to Sam's uh, 10 minutes? Sure, I'll do my best. Um, now, Sam spent a lot of time in Acts chapter two, and he suggested that Peter somehow failed to communicate what Trinitarians would say are essential elements of the gospel to these Jews at Pentecost they were trying to reach. I don't actually think that that's true. Um, in verses 16 to 18 uh, in Acts chapter two, Peter quotes Joel's prophecy that God would pour out his spirit. And he says it's being fulfilled before the Jewish people's very eyes. And then in verse 33, I believe it is. He says, um, he says, this Jesus, this is beginning in verse 32, this Jesus God raised up uh, and being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, uh, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he, that is Jesus, has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. And again, the prophecy of Joel that he quoted uh, has Yahweh pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. Now we can debate whether or not that substantiates my view, but my point is at least one very plausible pr prima facie reading of Peter's words there is that he did in fact think that uh, Jesus was incarnate Yahweh. Um, you know, I think that uh, I heard Sam say in his opening there that the Jews contemporary to Peter would have understood God to be one person, but uh, Sam has recently interviewed Eastern Orthodox scholar Bo Branson, who said in his interview with Sam, or his discussion with Sam, that Jews in that time would have been fine with two divine persons, uh, one of whom they would have identified as the Memra, uh, which I think is Aramaic for word, kind of like we might, uh, like we see in the Old Testament. So uh, I don't actually think that there's any reason for assuming that Jews would have would have thought Yahweh is uh, unipersonal, um, and and a scholar that. Uh, Sam has interviewed says as much. Now, uh, Sam asked me in his opening, in what sense did Jesus die if he was fully divine? And I answer this in my debate book with Dale Tuggy, a manuscript of which I sent to Sam to review beforehand. And so if he's read it, and, and if not, I'll understand. We haven't had a whole lot of time to prepare. He knows exactly how I'll answer that. Um, and I'll offer two possible answers, which aren't mutually contra uh, exclusive and aren't exhaustive. There are other conceivable answers as well. And they all play on an important um, an important detail of the law of non-contradiction in logic. It's sometimes stated as if the law says something can't both be and not be, uh, period. But that's not what it says. It says something cannot both be and not be in the same sense and at the same time. And the two possible answers I offer to this trade on those two qualifications. So take, for example, the issue of same sense. For a, divine, for a human being to die means that his or her body ceases to become animate. It, ceases to, it becomes inert, inanimate, inactive as a result of being separated from its life-giving soul, or, or you know, if you're a dualist, however you want to play that out. But of course, for a divine being to die would, be, would mean something entirely different, because a divine being, the divine being, has no body to die and soul invigorating uh, or animating that body. So yeah, Jesus as a uh, fully divine would not, could not die as a divine being. But that doesn't mean that he couldn't die as a human being, um, to, to suffer death in the sense of what it means for a human to die, which is different from what it would mean for God to die. Another possible explanation is a very historical view of incarnational Christology, known as the two minds view, uh, which is the idea that, um, or sorry, sorry, let me, that was something I offered to a different objection in the book. Rather, the, the, uh, the, uh, the doctrine of divine timelessness. So classic theology maintains that the divine being is outside of time. And by definition, that means that something that happens inside of time can't affect the, being, the divine being outside of time. So we can trade then on the qualification about being at the same time, that qualification of the logical non, law of non-contradiction, and say that outside of time, the divine being didn't die, but inside time, the incarnate uh, God did, in fact, die. Either of those two answers um, sufficiently answers the objection, uh, but of course, 
we can talk about that further as our discussion continues. How can Yahweh incarnate, how can Yahweh incarnate receive a promotion or exaltation or receive the Holy Spirit? Well, very simple. He, Yahweh incarnate was, is not just God. He's also human. The human Jesus began to exist at the incarnation. And so it's not that the human Jesus returned to a position of exaltation. No, because the human Jesus began uh, at the incarnation. But that human is who was exalted in much the same way that an author might exalt, be exalted if he incarnated himself in his novel. If, if uh, you know, really quickly in these last seconds I have, there's a famous issue of a uh, comic book in which um, uh, what's his name, uh, <laughs> the, the creator of the Marvel universe, he, um, he is in the comic book itself. So he incarnates himself in the comic book. Well, whatever happens to what he to his incarnation in the comic book doesn't affect his being outside of the comic book. And I would say the same is true here. God the Son became incarnate, and that human incarnate, uh, God incarnate, is who is exalted. Um, there's much more we could say, um, but I'll leave it at there because I'm already 30 seconds over my time. <laughs> I actually forgot to hit start, so I, I was off on my. <laughs> I keep track of my own time, so <laughs> yeah, I'm not worried about you. Um, your your Facebook post from a couple of days ago, Chris, starts to make sense. I was wondering if you might be hinting at something like that. Yeah, <laughs> I, lo I love that you guys have been like scouting each other. This is so cool. Um, Sam, would you like to give a five minute uh, response to Chris? Uh, sure. So to be honest, uh, my the one I had prepared is less relevant than I expected. So I might just wing this. I was mainly going to, with my rebuttal, focus a little bit on historical stuff. Um, maybe I'll just summarize that briefly and then kind of answer some of the more things that Chris said. Um, I would say that, um, that uh, Trinitarianism of the sort that Chris believes where um, God or Yahweh or the one true God is a tri-personal being doesn't really show up in the historical record until about 380 AD with like Gregory of Nazianzus probably being the first example. So it seemed weird to me if the early Christians were that when the first historical person who teaches something like that is, is about the same distance that we have from when the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock from the time when Jesus died. Um, and so you can go back in time and you can kind of see earlier versions of, of Christology and earlier versions of the Trinity, like Bo Branson, that, that uh, philosophy professor who's Eastern Orthodox that I interviewed, he promotes what's called monarchical Trinitarianism, where Yahweh or the one true God is only God the Father, but he shares his essence with the Son and the Spirit, but they aren't Yahweh, they're just co-divine eternal persons. Um, and that's really actually the form of the Trinity that you see in the Nicene Creed, right? That's why it starts, um, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, right? Because they, in some real sense, thought that that the truest God was still the Father and, and not the Son or the Spirit. And you can keep kind of peeling back the layers of going further back in time. The first time that the Trinity was used by a Christian to describe the Father, the Spirit, and the Son as the members of the Trinity was Tertullian writing around, writing around the year 200. Um, Tertullian is kind of a weird guy. He believed that God was a material substance within the universe, almost like an element on the periodic table. Right, so that, that's sort of a weird thing for us to think about in that God globbed off the sun and the spirit to out of his own stuff, like literal material stuff. So like, that's actually the first example of, of Christian Trinitarianism is something that's almost hard for us to imagine. But Tertullian also testified in that same work that Trinitarianism was a minority view at the time and that most of the people he knew didn't like the Trinity because it seemed like it was believing in more than one God. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of, I'll skip some of my other notes on that topic, but I'll say the further you go back in time, the, f the less Trinitarian Christianity appears to be. And the more there are alternatives to Trinitarianism, or if you go back far enough before the year 200, no one would have described themselves as a Trinitarian. So how can for 200 years, not even the, the doctrine that is defined as true Christianity not even really seem to exist? Now, if you were to ask the question of people saying that Jesus is God, you can go back much earlier than that on that particular point. But it's also important to remember that in the classical era, God could have meant a lot of different things. And it could have meant a second God or a subordinate God or just sort of a title or, or a Gnostic sense. There was, there was lots of different varieties of what it meant for Jesus to be God. Anyway, 
I'll stop there and just to, uh, I'll, I'll stop on that train of thought just to say that that earliest Christianity doesn't appear to be Trinitarian. And that's actually really not that controversial of a point among historians of, of uh, religion. Um, as far as Philippians 2 goes, I'll uh, appreciate that Chris complimented my interpretation. Um, but I suffice it to say that I think that Philippians 2 is about Jesus's earthly life. Um, and Chris said that no church fathers read um, Philippians 2 my way, and I don't think that's entirely true. Um, I'll make a case. It's, a, it's, not, it's not lockdown, so I'll, I'll say that. But, but Clement of Rome was one of the bishops of Rome, and he wrote a letter in like the 90s AD. He's actually one of the earliest writers outside the New Testament that we have. And um, Philippians 4 mentions a person named Clement. So it could very well be that Clement of Rome was actually mentioned in the letter of Philippians itself. That's not for certain, but in any case, um, that he was an early Christian writer. And in his letter to the Corinthian church, he says, for Christ is of those who are humble minded and not of those who exalt themselves over his flock. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the scepter of the majesty of God, did not come in the pride of pomp or arrogance, although he might have done so, but in a lowly condition, as the Holy Spirit has declared regarding him. And then it goes on to quote Philippians, or not Philippians, Isaiah 53 for a while. And you can see here that he's making the point that Jesus could have come in a prideful or arrogant way, exalting himself over everybody else and making everyone subject to him and kind of do his will. But instead, he was kind of a humble servant leader and came in a lowly condition. So this sort of, it, it, it certainly has echoes of Philippians 2. And we certainly know that Clement was very familiar with the writings of Paul. So I think that theme of Jesus not having been a, a selfish um, lording person while he was on earth, but instead being a humble person while he was on earth, was a very common theme in both the New Testament and outside the New Testament. And that's the basic gist of what I think Paul is trying to communicate there. I'll probably stop because I think I'm running out of time, but we, sure. I'll come to the, project, the protective bird imagery later, but I'll suffice to say that I don't find it very convincing. No, I appreciate that. You're only a few seconds over. You're good. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I just, I just want to say, Sam and Chris, I just appreciate both of you guys going to the text of scripture um, as your authority to uh, justify and defend your position. And, and I know, Chris, you have some quibbles with just using the term biblical with, with Unitarianism. Um, and maybe we, we can explore that later. Um, Sam, I, I, I'm going to pass this over to Chris or maybe just to both of you for discussion. Sure, sure. I was just in a conversation last night with my brother-in-law who has a, uh, he's a, uh, an Old Testament scholar. Uh, we study at the same place in Scotland together. And um, he, we actually got into a conversation about this. <laughs> <laughs> and we're both Trinitarian, but um, I, I raised the question. Well, I didn't raise the question. I, I stated that while I think Trinitarianism is an essential component of the architecture of the Christian faith, it's not essential for every individual to be saved. In mm -hmm. other words... I, you know, I, and I said this in an email exchange for between you and Chris that you know most first century believers, even as as a staunch Trinitarianism, a Trinitarian, most first century believers without the New Testament um, probably didn't have a Tertullian-ish articulation of the Trinity as a prerequisite for salvation. I don't think the thief on the cross was Trinitarian. Um, so I, th I think it's it's okay to make a distinction between something that's you know for my audience at least you know something that we see as really essential for the architecture of the Christian faith, which took hundreds of years to work out. You know, we didn't, we don't have the first statement on which books belong in the, in the new Testament until 367 by Athanasius, you know, so we, our new Testament was in flux for hundreds of years, which might um, relate to your um, uh, point about the very early Christians, let's just say 200 years, not even having their Trinitarianism worked out yet. Um, I would, maybe at some point love to explore how that relates to the formation of the canon. Um, mm -hmm. the, Trini the tr doctrine of the Trinity, it does seem to be dependent, not exclusively, but largely on the New Testament. Um, anyway, anyway, that, so the, the conversation last night, my brother-in-law said, well, Ignatius um, of Antioch was Trinitarian. We have clear statements about that. And he was, you know, what, he lived from like 35 AD to 100. Like you were close, 50 to 110. 50 yeah. to 110. Okay, so, so he's really early, and he 
He's just as early as Clement of Rome, yeah. Okay, so according yeah. to my brother-in-law, he was, had clear articulations of the Trinity. Do you have any... He, I wouldn't that's say not, that that's not he true. was... <laughs> yeah, not okay. True. Chris and I, I have, might agree. I, you know, in, in, in 2020, I've got Google up, I'm Googling stuff, and I have here, yeah. like, you know, some statements on it. But yeah, I would love to hear maybe both of your thoughts on Ignatius and the Trinity. And then I just, I just want to pass it on to you, and I'll shut up for a while. Yeah, Chris, you can go first. I'll probably just agree <laughs> with what you're about to say anyway. Well, I think you'll agree with some of what I say, but if you're like Dale Tuggy, you'll disagree with something else. Um, so let me say what I think we'll both agree on. If we are to take what's called the middle recension of Ignatius of Antioch's works to be genuine, um, as I do and as most scholars do, uh, then as opposed to what are called the long and short recensions, th this is a whole topic that would be a waste of our audience's time to get into deeply. But in that middle recension, Ignatius of Antioch, makes it extremely clear that he believes that Yahweh is, uh, sorry, that Jesus is incarnate Yahweh. Uh, so for example, um, he writes, uh, uh, let's see here, he says, he says Jesus is both made and not made, God existing in flesh, true life and death, both of Mary and of God, first passable and then impassable. He is him who is above all time, eternal and invisible, yet who became visible for our sakes, impalpable and impassable, yet who became passable on our account. So it's very clear that if we take this middle recension of his epistles to be genuine, then yes, Ignatius tied for the earliest Christian writing we have, other than the New Testament itself, he believed that Jesus was incarnate Yahweh. And it's very clear he doesn't believe that Jesus is the Father. So, but there is no indication, so far as I can tell, that Ignatius believed that the Holy Spirit is a person uh, or, or, or in any other way affirmed Trinity. And that's why I would disagree with your, uh, with the person that you were just talking about. Now, I think that so far, and Sam can correct me if I'm wrong, we would agree. But if he's like Dale I might, Tug I might make one point and let you continue. Sure. And maybe I might have to ask just for clarification on this later. But I think I, I'm a little bit confused sometimes about the way you use Yahweh, because hmm. I would say that I, I would agree that uh, that Ignatius of um, Antioch was what thought that Jesus was God in some sense, obviously. Um, I'm not an expert on him. I've maybe read him once and it maybe wasn't even that recently, so I won't speak beyond my expertise. But I think that you sometimes maybe underestimate the complexity of the different ways people could believe someone was God. And that when you say, believe someone was Yahweh, what I hear you saying is that Yahweh is a person and Jesus was also somehow subsisting in that person. Whereas I do think that like Ignatius didn't speak Hebrew. He actually wouldn't have known the word Yahweh. He would have been speaking Greek and he would have known the word theos. But in Greek, you can either use theos to mean a person, or you can use it to mean substance, right? Like, you are a human is sort of what you are, and your, your humanness is sort of the abstract quality that you have, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's not the same, like, so sometimes I think it's like the, the distinction between who and what, right? And then even in those days, there were gradations of ways that you could be God. And sure. I would bet that I, I'm, I'm, I'm on a limb, so I probably shouldn't even say this, but I bet if you dug through the authentic writings of Ignatius, you could find ways in which it was pretty clear that he believed in some kind of subordinationism in terms of Jesus not being as important or as powerful or, or perhaps something like that as, as God the Father, whom he would have called the God as opposed to. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to just God as like an adjective, right? It's the difference between a personal sure. noun and an adjective. Sure. Well, so a few things there. First of all, um, just because even if it, even if you can find something in Ignatius that indicates that he believes that the Son is subordinate to the Father, that wouldn't support your uh, your view over mine. Um, as you know, Bo Branson represents an Eastern Orthodox view of the Trinity, which is very hierarchical. Um, the even many evangelicals believe in the eternal subordination of the Son to the Father. That's true. Um, so so just because e even if we were to see Irena or Ignatius affirming the Son subordination of the Father, you wouldn't have something other than Trinity. Um, secondly, 
yes, I agree with you. Just using the word theos does not mean that he believes Jesus is God in the same sense that the Father is. But that's but that's kind of the whole point. It's also the very reason why I point to this passage in Matthew with the protective bird imagery, because sometimes using saying somebody, some such or somebody is God doesn't tell you a whole lot. But when you start saying other things, it becomes much clearer than if you had simply said such and such is God. So when Ignatius says that Jesus is both made and not made, that he's true life, that he's passable and impassable, that he's eternal and invisible, that he's above all time, um, impalpable and impassable, yet became passable. This is, exa- this is language that just could not describe um, a creature. Um, and that's what I'm trying to say is I think Ignatius was a monotheist. He believed. I would agree that he didn't think Jesus was a creature. I, okay. I, I well, and, that, and, and to be yeah. clear by creature, I mean, he, he's not, he didn't come into being at some point. But just to be clear. It, it also gets weird when you talk about coming into being before time or before creation gets made. Cause th- that was one, like one of those whole things that the whole Aryan controversy was about. Like, is there time before the beginning of creation or, or exactly, you know, it, it, it gets a little bit funny that way. A lot of the subordinationist, subordinationist kind of binitarian sort of high pre-existence form of Jesus would still have thought that Jesus came out of the father, or that the pre-existent son came out of the father. I, sure. I suppose we might be getting a little bit too deep in the woods on Ignatius. Like, I would certainly agree that there are people that are well on the way towards what later will become Trinitarianism and around the year 100, but they weren't there yet. And there are some noticeable and important distinctions. And the fact that there are distinctions between later Trinitarians and early super exalted language about Jesus being God sort of people like Ignatius or Justin or, or Clement of Alexandria, it, it points in the direction of of change and development over time, and if you take if you extrapolate that backwards, that means that it wasn't there earlier. No, that's I, I don't agree with you there, with the utmost of respect. I, I would agree with you, and I think this, as you pointed out in your opening, is fairly um, uncontroversial. That the doctrine of the Trinity, as we understand it, is something that developed over time. I, I totally agree with you there. But what I think you can't demonstrate with the historical data is that the belief that Jesus is incarnate Yahweh developed over time. As far as I can tell, based on my meager history over graphical skills. That's simply a bald claim that Unitarians make, but which they can't substantiate. Um, well, in fact- there were, I mean, another, another leg of this story is that there were a lot of people who didn't agree with the early kind of what I'll, I might call proto-Trinitarians, right? Sure. Um, like people like Ignatius or Justin or something like that. There, there were also other theologians and also other church fathers who disagreed with them. And they seem to have been perhaps even more numerous in the earliest stages. Like I can point to early church fathers or, well, they're not called child fathers because they're discarded as heretical in most cases, who agreed with me, or at least I think they did. We don't have a lot of their writings because they didn't survive very well. But it's clear when, uh, when proto-Trinitarians are writing works against people that they disagree with, that some of the people that they disagreed with sound a lot like what I'm trying to say now. So there, and there was also Gnostics, and there was also modalists, right? There, there was at least four or five major strains of thought within early Christianity, one of which I would agree with, one of which is more similar to you, although I would say that the early versions of the strain that lead to you actually have important dif- differences from you. Well, I agree that there are some differences, but where I disagree with you is that these different groups you've cited are evidence that the that there was disagreement over whether Jesus was incarnate Yahweh. Um, you mentioned, for example, modalists. Well, they're on my side of the question of who Jesus is. They just don't believe in the kind Trinity. Of. Well, sure, but they, they, but they believe there was, although, they, believe, they believe there was one, there's one God, one being that is God, um, one person that is God, and that person is Jesus and the Father and so forth. Um, 
but they still believed he was incarnate Yahweh. And I think that there's, I, my contention as somebody who's not a professional historian is that when you look at all these various disagreeing positions in the early church, what you find is not, is certainly uh, they, they disagree on how to make sense of Jesus identity, but what they all, but that struggle to make sense of it seems to be a struggle to reconcile something. They all agree two things that they all agreed on one monotheism and two that Jesus is that God. That's my contention, and of course, we'd have to I, dive into I, the weeds yeah, to figure sure. that out. I think very, very few of them, except the early modalists, would have said that Jesus is that God. I think that distinction was far more universal than unity, I'll say, and that really the earliest people who would have said that Jesus was God in the higher sense, again, they were speaking Greek, they, they wouldn't have used the word Yahweh, except for maybe some of the Aramaic Christians, but um, but that there is far more emphasis on distinction. And one of the earliest heresies that gets condemned is patripassianism, sure. which was an early way of criticizing modalists because it just seems scandalous, the idea that God himself would have come down and be crucified. And that was actually it, very- It was scandalous that the father would do so. But they meant it as the same thing. And I don't think that I'm reading that back into it. I and think that's where that, I think we're going to disagree, yeah. Fair enough. And in any case- I think we've laid out our historical narratives yeah. a little bit. I think Preston this? is right. Yeah, no, this is this is actually good. I, th I think the early church uh, perspective on this is important, but I don't want it to exhaust all our yeah. time. Now, yeah. How about this? Um, Sam and then Chris, can you give just a 30-second summary of how you understand, let's just say, the pre-Constantine and, and post-Constantine maybe church view on this? Um, the kind of messy pre-Constantine first few hundred years, the canon's not even complete. There's lots yeah. of diversity. Like, how would you summarize that? And then, obviously, Trinitarianism becomes the kind of, I, I don't want to mm -hmm. put words in there, you know, the, the accepted main view and, and maybe explain why that happens. It might, might take more than 30 seconds. How about a minute? How about a minute each? <laughs> okay. Constantine, Constantine view on the Trinity. I'll do my best. I think that the earliest one, or the earliest strains of Christianity were similar to what I was describing. And in fact, numerous of the early Jewish groups who split off from sort of mainstream Christianity because they were Hebrewizers or Judaizers who wanted to maintain the law had a very similar Christology to me. I disagreed with them about, you know, faith and grace and works and circumcision and stuff. But I think that early split in the family tree points to the fact that the earliest Christology was more Jewish and sounded like what I described earlier. I think the second thing that showed up on the scene almost simultaneously was actually Gnosticism, right? And Gnosticism thought that Jesus was God, but just not incarnate, right? He was from some spiritual realm and he was like a phantom walking around or something like that, but he wasn't actually a fleshly body. And you can actually see writings in the New Testament criticizing that view, which shows how early that that was. So I think the first two views on the scene were something like Jewish standard Unitarianism, exalted Christology, and Gnosticism. Then one of the next things to show up, I think, is kind of simultaneously you start seeing modalism and kind of very platonically influenced Jesus Logosism right? Jesus Logosism would be the strain that becomes both actually Arianism and Trinitarianism, but in its earliest stages, like Justin Martyr, who was a Platonic philosopher before he was a Christian, he sort of thought of God as this one high being above all, of whom you can't really say anything, and then he begets the Logos, and then the Logos becomes incarnate, right? And that was a very Platonically influenced idea. And then they're sort of swirling and arguing, right? There's no central authority in the early Christian church right. in the days that they're persecuted. And di different pockets of the empire believe different things. And, and sometimes there's disagreement within churches. And then sort of slowly over time, I think the, especially the highly educated population centers like Alexandria and later Constantinople and Antioch and stuff like that, kind of bought more into the platonic proto-trinitarian but also proto-arian version of things and that because that sort of won the core you might say sort of won the the stronghold of of intellectual opinion that that's sort of what became to dominate and then constantine has the council of nicaea and that is like the people think oh that decided the trinity for all time no like half the people who signed the 
the um, First Nicene Creed were Arians, um, and half of them were Trinitarians, but Arian, Arius himself didn't like it. And then there was almost a century of like Christian civil war before the Trinity won out in like the late 300s and early 400s. And even then, Arianism was the langu- the the theology of the barbarians for centuries thereafter. So it's it's really messy, but I do think that my side lost out in part because it wasn't as popular among the intelligentsia and because it seemed more Jewish than it did seem in line with popular pagan philosophy of the time. Thank you for that, Sam. That's super interesting. Chris, give me 30 seconds. I'm going to come to you. <laughs> Sorry, mine was way longer. Jack with a commercial, a commercial break <laughs> that given all this messiness, even if what Sam said is, has a measure of truth. It is fascinating that one of the few things that the early church did agree upon is that Christians should be nonviolent. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't see that coming, did you? I, I didn't. didn't. Throw that in there because I read all this stuff and it's like they were pretty unanimous on that. They couldn't even agree on the Trinity, but they agreed that Christians shouldn't be violent. All right, Chris, they go with your uh, summary of the early church. Sure. Yeah. Um, so you, when I went into my debate with Dale Tuggy, I was a little nervous going into my study of the historical details because it's often, this is a common meme you hear nowadays that when Trinitarians go to the historical data, they end up finding out, whoa, th- there's no basis for this there. What I actually found is that the historical data favors uh, Trinitarianism rather than works against it. Um, we've already talked about Ignatius of Antioch who uses language that really can't be mistaken for thinking that he believed a creature or, or something that began to exist, uh, became incarnate in Jesus. And interestingly, Ignatius's works, they seem at greater pains to emphasize the reality of Jesus's human existence. It was, it was Jesus's humanity that was more in question in Ignatius's mm-hmm. day because than he, his divinity. Because Ignatius uh, hated uh, the Gnostics. I'm oh, sorry for interrupting. That's but, right. Yeah. Um, so there's Ignatius, and, and he's between 50 and 110 AD. Justin Martyr, in 160, um, he tr- attempts to persuade his Jewish readers that the pre-incarnate Christ is the Yahweh in Psalms 24, 10, and 99, 4 to 5. Uh, Melito of Sardis in 170, he says uh, that he that hung up the earth in space was himself hanged up. He that fixed the heavens was fixed with nails. God put to death. And the writer to Diognetus, this is uh, Mathetes, I think is, is, is what we're talking about here, but it's, it's the one writing to Diognetus between 150 and 200. He says, God has sent from heaven and placed among men him who is the truth and the holy and incomprehensible word, the very creator and fashioner of all things. So what you see in the earliest writings that we have from Christians is that they all agree that this Yahweh who is speaking and, and whose actions are recorded in the Old Testament is, is Jesus incarnate. How they make sense of that, how they, how they reconcile this reality with their commitment to monotheism is, is, is the story that unfolds from there. How to, you know, how, how uh, tri, you know, whether Trinitarianism or Arianism or whatever, um, so, so you have the development over time of how to make sense of those two facts, but those two facts nevertheless appear to be true. And what's interesting is that even after Nicaea, even um, councils that were um, uh, that resisted Nicaea still affirmed the centrality of Jesus's deity to the faith. Uh, so, for example, um, Dale Tuggy in one of his books, he observes that what is called the Second Creed of Sirmium Sur- in 357, it excludes some of the language of Nicaea. But what historians recognize is that this wasn't really a creed at all. It was a position paper signed begrudgingly and under duress by a supporter of Nicaea in the presence of a tiny handful of anti-Nicene bishops. But meanwhile, while the earlier first creed of Sirmium, which came about 25 years or so after Nicaea, it echoes Nicaea's confession that the Son, who before all ages was begotten from the Father, is God from God, light from light, by whom all things were made. And it, it, it curses, it pronounces anathema against anyone who says that there was a time when the Son didn't exist. Uh, and, and there's much more I could say there. So you've got this really interesting historical um, reality here, I think, uh, and, and this is demonstrable, I think. You've got the church trying to make sense of the fact that there's only one God, and yet this God is Jesus. Um, 
and, and how that is worked out is something that takes place over time. But even after Nicaea, and even in councils that are trying to resist Nicaea to some degree, the deity of Christ and his identity as the Yahweh of the Old Testament is, 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 is affirmed by such councils as essential to the faith. So what I would say is this. I would say that the doctrine of the Trinity as it came to be known isn't what's essential to Christianity necessarily. What I would say is essential to Christianity based on this historical data is that Jesus is Yahweh incarnate and Jesus isn't the father. Um, how we make sense of those two things is uh, another question. Um, but those, that's why I focus on that in my, in my case for the Trinity. And we, we haven't even gotten to the spirit yet. I, I don't even mind focusing. <laughs> People, it's the third leg of the Trinity, the third yeah, wheel of the Trinity. But, yeah. And in a sense, I mean, if all we did is focus on uh, the relationship between Jesus and God, the father, to use Trinitarian language, um, whether they are both God in the same way and distinct persons, we can almost center on that for our discussion. I don't, I don't even mind, you know, not exhausting the spirit or, or is the spirit essential to your position, Sam? I mean, is that, uh, it's I would say that the, the stuff about the spirit in the new Testament is more confusing and weird. I think we can all agree sometimes that the, the yeah. passages about the Holy Spirit are sometimes a little head scratching. I, I, um, I mean, I don't know, Chris. I mean, I, I would agree that when it comes to the Trinity, it's much, there's much more New Testament footing for the Son and the Father in, in the sort of Trinitarian way. The Spirit, I mean, we could go to Acts 5 and there's personality characteristics describing the Spirit and there's other passages, but it's not as pervasive as, say, Jesus and the Father being different yet one. Would you agree with that, Chris? I would say a qualified yes. You know, the, I think the thing that is interesting about the language used to describe the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is that, yes, it is, or he is, as I would say, personalized. He, he's, he's presented using personal language, but it's difficult, I think, to press that into service strongly in favor of the Trinity. I mean, there's no reason that God, I mean, God's word in some texts is personified in a way that I don't think even Trinitarians would want to say means his word in those passages is in fact a person. Um, so, so I would say the, the personal language of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is under, de, is under, de, it, it doesn't, it's under, under determining. I'll go with that. I'll agree with that. But, but what tips the scale for me into affirming the personhood of the Holy Spirit is that once you accept, as I do, and of course Sam doesn't, but once you accept that the Son is a divine person, equal, uh, equal and equally eternal and so forth to the Father, well then you've got to contend with the fact that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all, you know, it's the same name that they all three share by which people are baptized in the New Testament. Um, and, and so I find it unlikely, although not impossible, that the, the authors of the New Testament would believe there are these two divine persons, father and son, and then there's this active work or, or, or uh, you know, activity in the world on the part of God, and, and, and they're lumping those three together. That wouldn't make much sense to me, but it does make a lot of sense if the Holy Spirit is also one of those three divine persons, and that would be what tips the personal language, the underdetermining personal language about the Holy Spirit um, over the over the fence into my camp. That would be my position. Okay, my, my brief response on, on pneumatology, um, to show off fancy words, would be that sometimes the Holy Spirit is talked about like it's a person or in a personified sort of way, and sometimes it's not. And I think it's okay to personify something, but it's not okay to deperson a person, right? And so I would agree that the Holy Spirit has personified language in the same way that, like, like you mentioned, probably you were thinking of Proverbs 8 in terms of, you know, God's wisdom being personified. But it's not, it, it's never talked about as something that's worshipped. It's never talked about as something that's kind of like, I don't know, out there doing its own thing, really. Uh, I, I think it's something a little bit hazier and more mysterious and something like the way that God works in the world. And, you know, it's, it's God's spirit. I really think that's just the simplest, you know, way to describe what it is. Just, just to be clear though, um, the fact that the Holy Spirit doesn't receive the kind of attention you just described doesn't lend itself to your view over ours because our view rightly or wrongly is that the Holy Spirit's role is to point people to the son and to the father. Um, and so we would and expect, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Well, the <laughs> difference being, I believe he's a person. <laughs> 
Uh, so uh, anyway, my point is I, I understand the challenge from the fact that he is sometimes spoken of without personal terms, uh, and that's a legitimate challenge. Uh, but I don't think the fact that he's not worshipped, et cetera, means, it means anything really. So I, I think that, yeah, the topic of the Holy Spirit is a little underdetermined, <laughs> and it's hard for either of us to nail each other down on that one. I'll go along with that. Um, where do you guys want to, I would love to go back to maybe some of the passages we talked about Philippians sure. two or the, sure. uh, Jesus and the mother hen kind of reference or <laughs> Hebrews one. Um, and I'll just, whoever wants to jump in, um, any, any could, major concerns, pushbacks to what maybe one of you have, have said about those passages? Could, can I ask uh, Chris some, some questions about sort of maybe almost philosophical questions about what exactly he means? No. Uh, Okay, so no, I'm right. <laughs> back to Philippians 2 then. Because yeah. <laughs> honestly, there's part of me that's, that's still honestly a little bit legitimately confused by what exactly you mean by your words. And okay. I, I want to be clear that I, I understand you before I criticize you or else I could be punching a paper dragon or missing the mark. And so before I do that, I, I really want to know what you mean. So like, I'm still a little bit confused by the way you use the word Yahweh, because I would only ever use the word Yahweh to mean a person, right? To me, when you say the Father is Yahweh, the Son is Yahweh, the Spirit is Yahweh, what I hear you saying is there's like three sub-persons who make up one super person or something like that. Whereas I not sure if that's what you mean. I think you are using Yahweh as something almost like an essence or a quality. No, no, I, I accept that Yahweh is a personal name, but what I'm, but I don't believe that therefore only one person can be, uh, uh, can be referred to using that name. If it's true that the being that is God who presents himself personally in the Old Testament is, uh, ascri is, is ascribed the name Yahweh or, or ascribes to himself the name Yahweh, and especially if that name um, is itself a, uh, a, 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 has its root in a, in a verb, you know the, the the copula in in the Old Testament Hebrew haya, um, then it would which make is sense. singular and personal and uh, right yeah okay anyway the, but anyway so so if the being that is if the being that is you know the being that is necessarily um, can if if the person who um, manifests the being of God in the Old Testament can be described using the name Yahweh or referred to using the name Yahweh. I don't see any reason for thinking that name can't equally apply to the other okay. divine persons. The, the thing that confuses me is it sounds like you have four persons. It sounds like you have the Father, the Son, the Spirit, and Yahweh. But how... I, is that right or is that wrong? <laughs> well, it, it's wrong insofar as it doesn't reflect my view. Um, as, as I explained in the opening, in my, my 10 minute opening, I believe that the word person in Trinitarian language, which by the way, I, hopefully we can all agree, isn't how we use person now. Right. Yeah. This, this is a mistake that Dale Tuggy made in his closing argument in our book. The whole time we're using person in Trinitarian terms. And then all of a sudden at the end of the book, he treats it as if I've been using person in the language that we use nowadays. And, and this is the problem with some of these debates. But um, but when I talk about person using Trinitarian language, I, I defined it right there in the beginning of my opening. It, it, it's a personal self. And it's it's the self. It's it, when I say my being the person, the personal self, is the possessor of being. And it's something that subsists in being. Is It isn't a concrete thing separable from it. Um, and even though creatures are universally unipersonal, I don't see any reason for thinking that the divine being can't be tripersonal. So it, what I it believe- still seems, It still seems like you have four persons. Though. Not using Trinitarian language, because in, in, order to, in order to say that I believe in four persons using Trinitarian language, you would have to say that there's a fourth uh, personal self that subsists in the being of God, a, first, uh, a, a fourth subject and object of interpersonal relations, and I don't believe that's true. So does Yahweh have his own mind? Uh, I am uh, undecided on whether mind is a property of being or a property of person. Um, so I think it's, I would be equally comfortable saying that there's one divine mind shared by all three divine persons, or by saying that mind being a property of person is something that each person has individually. I think either of you. Okay, but then it sounds like, so like, talk, when I was talking with Bo Branson, when I read Augustine and read the early church fathers, 
it seems clear to me that they use God as a as a what, as like a thing that you can be. A like being. Sam, Sam, Preston, and Chris are human beings, mm -hmm. right? Which exist, and we have the we all share human nature, and there is one category that is essence or nature, right? And you, <laughs> all three of us, have it, and so so like they they use it much more like the way that we use the word category or type of thing and so i hear you saying not quite like so so are 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 so here's the question are are the father the son and the holy spirit parts of yahweh no so then how can how can yahweh be being baptized in the jordan river look down on someone being baptized in the Jordan River with approval and descend upon someone being baptized in the Jordan River simultaneously. Well, first of all, if, as I said, the divine being is timeless, then Yahweh outside of time uh, can do things at the same time as Yahweh in time is doing other things. Uh, I gave the analogy. It sounds like two Yahwehs. But it's not. Because in order for it to be two Yahwehs, you'd have to have a Yahweh, you'd have to have two Yahwehs in time. But there's not. There's there's the Yahweh out. There's the being outside of time, and there's Yahweh incarnate in the person in in the human Christ uh, that is coming up out of the Jordan. But then That's, you have multiple beings. No, I thought that you don't. your whole point is that there's one being. You don't have multiple beings, at least not multiple divine beings, multiple substances, multiple divine substances. You've got the divine substance outside of time. and the Multiple human divine substance is a very unique phrase. I've never heard anyone say there's more than one divine substance. I'm not saying there's more than one divine substance. That's my point. So there's the divine substance that's outside of time, according to divine timelessness, which is a very, has a great historical pedigree. And then there's the human substance in which the sun, the, the person of the sun subsists in time. So you've got the divine substance outside of time, the human substance inside of time, one person in, in which those two uh, per, uh, substances are united, those two natures are united. That's not two, that's not two divine beings. It's one divine being and one human being and the human and the, and the divine person of the sun subsists in them both. So uh, going back to what I was trying to say a moment ago to use an analogy, and, and you saw me talking about this on Facebook, so you kind of know what I'm getting at with this, but you know, very often uh, in the mind of an author, the story that he or she tells in a novel is, is very real. Um, and if you take that uh, in a, on a human level and you make it a, a real thing where God is the divine author and time is the, is the story that takes place in the story he's written, there's a, there, there's a transcendence, a relationship of transcendence there. The, the whole world is not, God isn't inside of that world. He's outside of that world. He transcends it. And if that transcendent divine being, if one person in that divine transcendent being chooses to become incarnate in the story, then you've got, you don't have multiple beings. You've got one being outside in, in the transcendent world who then manifests as a different kind of being inside the world, inside that story. That doesn't mean you've got multiple gods. It just means you've got God outside of time and God as human inside of time. Can I clarify something real quick? Mm -hmm. so, so the question is, so you have God the Father, and, and using classic Trinitarian language, God the Father, God the Son, God, God the Holy Spirit are all God. And then as Sam is brought up, you have this concept or person of Yahweh. And so is Yahweh the Trinity or is Yahweh the Father? Is that, is that a simple way of, just, of asking a question? Or is, God way some, is Yahweh someone else entirely, which is, I or, can't help but hear that. Well, I think you can't help but hear that. Um, so when you say God, he, or God himself, who are you talking about? Because you it, that is language that you use to refer about a self or a person, mm -hmm. but you can only seemingly refer to either the Father or the Son or the Spirit as a person. So how can you use selfhood language to talk about someone that isn't one of those three persons because we, we only wait, ever real quick chris can i jump can we distinct we keep using the term person do you mean individual um we, we could assume that person could have plurality within that for the sake of the argument but individual means there's one 
individual, right? So yeah. is it, would that be a better phrase? Because I think we might be using language as talking past. I don't think you're going to find any word that satisfies all parties. I use the phrase personal self. And, and, and the best way I can imagine, Preston, you tell your wife, Chris, and obviously you're talking to your Chris, not me. Chris, I love you with all of my very being. I love you too, Chris. But <laughs> If you said that, who is the I that possesses the being? Yeah. Right? Those aren't numerically identical. When you say I, you're not referring to your being because otherwise you wouldn't be able to say my being. There's something about um, personal self that subsists in being such that you can refer to my being, my soul, my mind, whatever, without, without just using those two things as synonyms. And what I'm suggesting is that whatever you want to call that personal self, person, individual, hypostasis, subsistence, you know, however, and by the way, that is what the early fathers meant when they used languages like subsistence and so forth is to say, these persons don't exist as concrete things independent from the being of God. They subsist in it. So what I'm saying is that that thing, whatever you want to call it, that can speak of my being that's what I'm calling person. And for all creatures, there's only one of those. For, there's, only, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between person and being. But so what? What, what prevents God from, in that way, being tripersonal? That's what I've failed to see. There's certainly nothing logically contradictory or incoherent about it. Um, and, you know, by very definition, you have three, uh, in this language, to use the language I've been using, You've got three persons and one being. You don't have four persons or four beings. I, w I would love to get back to the, the text and look at um, some of the passages sure. you looked at. But, but Sam, do you have, a, do you have any um, Well, hold on. But, but... I have, I have 10,000 questions, but maybe. <laughs> honestly, I've, I've spent a lot of time reading lots of Trinitarians, both ancient ones, medieval ones, and modern ones. And I still honestly don't really understand what you mean, Chris. You don't seem similar to any Trinitarian that I have previously interacted with. I don't really know what you mean. Well, this goes to another problem, I think, that, that Preston and I were discussing in the call before you got on, which is that um, I think the church has failed its people in that in recent generations, it has failed to um, instruct Christians on what the Trinity is and why we should believe it. Uh, and so it's no surprise to me that you that that you aren't able to make sense of a lot of Trinitarians. I don't think that I think most. I am able to make sense of most Trinitarians, even if I disagree with them. I well, don't really understand. And that's probably what you're because. Saying. And that's well, I'm using really the same kind of language that you would see from a thousand years ago in, say, Thomas Aquinas. He spoke in the same way that that the persons subsist in the being of God. Uh, in fact, but he didn't. Anyway, keep going. Well, and, and in fact, the 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 historic well. The Latin form of Trinitarianism, if I'm not mistaken, would say that the persons simply are, there is numeric identity between the persons and their relationships. So they would say that the relationship of, uh, of paternity, I think is the word for it, uh, you know, being a father, that relationship is numerically identical to the person of the father, and that the relationship of filiation is, the, is, the, uh, uh, the, is identical to, numerically, the person of the son, and these relations subsist in the being of God. This is extremely historic language I'm using. Now you're starting to sound like something that I can recognize. That's starting to sound like Aquinas and Augustine. Right. So, but, so I'm just But using... they didn't think that God himself was someone that you could talk about in personal terms like that without communicating through one of the individual persons. I feel, the, I, I feel exactly the same way. But when you, what... when you say Yahweh himself, mm -hmm. though, I feel like you either need to mean one of the three persons or you're somehow talking about them collectively. When I say Yahweh himself, I'm referring to... Uh, the being of God who can only be spoken about and to through his personal selves. Um, you can say I'm, I'm referring to all the persons collectively as Yahweh because I'm using Yahweh to refer to each of the three persons simultaneously. However you want to catch that out, it's fine. Okay. But, but they're all three persons that subsist in the being of God. And if Yahweh is the proper name for any person uh, that subsists in God, then it applies equally to all three.
So okay, that was that was clear. That, that was clearer than the earlier stuff. <laughs> I'm glad I, I don't know if I'm <laughs> even a heretic or not because I, I have not dabbled. I mean, I've um, I've studied this in the past. I mean, I would say maybe 15 years ago in my studies in early Judaism, and it was really because there was such a pervasive view in early Judaism of plurality within God that the New Testament seems to fall right in line with an early and early Jewish perspective on the divine. Um, That's certainly my Richard view. Richard Bakken's book is largely why I'm a... Mm, count me triggered. But. This book is largely why I'm a Trinitarian. <laughs> this in the Bible, too. <laughs> but um, So it's because of my large you know, Jewish bent in the Jewish background of the New Testament where I arrive at that. Um, but it, from my understanding, and, and again, I, I, don't even know if I, I don't know if I'm violating like an early Christian creed here. So just... <laughs> I'm what pretty good fire? at knowing where the boundary lines are. Like, from my vantage point, I mean, you have, like, you know, God, G-O-D, Elohim, which is a plural term often used in the singular in, say, Genesis 1. And then you have let us make God an our, or let, let us make man in our image. You have singularity and plurality already in, in a rhythmic dance in Genesis 1. And then all throughout Genesis 2, 4 to the rest of the chapter, you have Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Elohim, so that Yahweh becomes synonymous with this concept of God, which already in Genesis 1 and 2 has some kind of allowance for some kind of plurality within that. And then throughout the Old Testament, you have flickers of that plurality being kind of opened up. You have Daniel 7, the son of man approaching, you know, um, the ancient of days, or as the Septuagint has it, I believe, as the ancient of days, like the son of man as the ancient of days or to the... There's just, there's ambiguity in, is the son of man the ancient of days? Is he different? Either way, the ancient of days passes on some kind of authority that only the ancient of days can possess. So you have already that plurality and then books like one Enoch expand on that kind of uh, plurality within God. So that when we come to the New Testament, the very concept of Yahweh as God is a bit flexible um, so that when Jesus is distinguished from G-O-D or Theos and yet sometimes associated with Theos and I mean John, John's gospel or even the book of Revelation um, it just seems to kind of follow that that trajectory um, all, all that to say for me Yahweh could refer to the Trinity depending on the context or also in some contexts like Theos could single out a particular member of the Trinity, like we see Theos in Acts 2, is clearly referring to God the Father in distinction from God the Son. Um, but I don't think that necessarily means Theos can't also, in other passages, include God the Son in the d divine identity. How did I do? Is that? <laughs> and, and again, I, I, I don't. I don't. I don't think anyone will be chasing you with pitchforks for that. Okay. No, that that sounded that sounded great and i wholeheartedly agree you know one i've always ever since becoming a christian been struck by just how plural how pl pluripersonal if you will uh yahweh appears to be in the old testament um you know uh, unitarians like to dismiss this text but the early christians didn't uh genesis 19 24 yahweh reigned on sodom and gomorrah sulfur and fire from yahweh out of heaven and it's referring here to the two ostensibly angels that had been talking to abraham earlier at the oaks of mamre um the father you know a, a theophany of the father appears to be remain appears to remain behind and talk to abram while uh, these other two what are ostensibly angels go to uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and then this text says Yahweh rained down Sodom and Gomorrah from, uh, with sulfur and fire from Yahweh out of heaven and early Christians as I as I quote in my book said in fact they anathematized some of them people who denied that son that the pre-incarnate son is the uh, one of these two Yahweh's so, and there are other texts we could cite too, but it seems to me that, um, yeah, I'm in full agreement with you. There's, there's an incredible flexibility to the personhood of Yahweh in the Old Testament, and the New Testament seems to fall perfectly in line with that. Um, I don't accept, and I could be wrong, but I don't accept the common Unitarian refrain that somehow unipersonality is distinctively Jewish in the, in, in the time of the New Testament. That just doesn't seem to cohere with the biblical and historical data to me. All right, Sam, um, we've, we've I'll briefly, been going back and forth for a while. So yeah, I would love to give you some space here to 
unpack some I'll, of that or respond? I'll briefly respond because I know I'm probably a little out of my depth in terms of experts on early Judaism. But I'll say that early Judaism, like around the time of the first century, say, was diverse. Right. There were the Sadducees who disagreed with the Pharisees. There was people in caves in Qumran. There was people like Philo of Alexandria who were super Platonist philosophers. Right. Like it's way more complex than most people think, obviously. Did people like Philo in some sense foreshadow the later developments of the Trinity? Yes, but I think that's because he's like the first example of the admixture of high Platonism with um, sort of Judeo-Christianity. And I think, yeah, there's like some two powers in heaven sort of Jews over there in some caves. But I think that the main core of Judaism, especially Pharisaical Judaism, which was the kind that Jesus was most interactive with and seemingly kind of represented, even though he had strong disagreements with it, was very unipersonal in their understanding of God. And that that later tradition was very anti-Trinitarian. And that was one of the main things that early Trinitarians and Jews disagreed about. And so I think you can see in the history of the interaction between the mainstream of Judaism and Christianity that the Trinity divided Christians from Jews and didn't unite them together. So I, that would be my point. And I think that that division is pretty inarguable. I, I would agree. I think what is arguable, however, is the reason why that divided. Um, I, think, I think the case could be made, or at the very least, the explanation for the phenomenon that you're describing could be offered as um, the, the, the Jewish people that rejected the Messiahship of Christ um, saw those who embraced the Messiahship of Christ affirming a multi personal Yahweh, a multi-personal God. And so that was just one of the things that they resisted in order to justify their rejection of, of Christ's Messiahship. In other words, their, their insistence upon a unipersonal God plausibly is something that resulted from uh, Christianity uh, rather than preceding it. I would agree that Judaism in many ways was shaped by and counter-reacted to Christianity in a very similar way that Catholicism changed a lot after the Protestant Reformation. But I would disagree that the unipersonality of God was part of that. I would think that like the early Jewish Christian groups who actually survived in like t until the Middle Ages, um, were very Unitarian. To, that's an anachronistic word, obviously. They didn't call themselves that, but they were very unipersonal in their identity of God, the early Jewish Christian groups. Um, and so I, I think that the Judaism with which Christianity was most closely associated was very Unitarian. So, but we should maybe finally move on to the Bible, I guess, because honestly, I'm, I'm at the limit of my knowledge on that subject. That's what I was going to suggest as well. I'll be, as it might be over good. the end of my skis. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've got some more, because that's more and more my passion lies, but let, let's move on. Um, yeah, let's go back to the text. What do you guys, what text do you want to go to? Uh, well, let's do Philippians 2, man. <laughs> yeah, I'd love I, to that seems to be a big one, yeah. It, it, it is certainly a big one. So I, I think that that'll also show how our theology looks in action. So let's, sure. um, Sam, why don't, why don't you, let's just go to, let's skip ahead to chapter two, verse, um, is it six or seven, six? Uh, or probably start at five because it ends with Christ Jesus. Sure. Okay, yeah. let's start at five. And um, I, we don't need to, why don't you, Sam, walk through the first few verses there, two, five, and following, and how, how you understand uh, that text, and I'll have uh, Chris give his understanding of the text. Because this, this is really a, I mean, as both of you know, I mean, there's, it's, there, it's one of the most difficult passages in the, in the New Testament in terms of translation no. of words and possible interpretations. Um, it's also one that is really central to our discussion, so. Uh, yeah, Sam, sure. Why don't you work through this passage somewhat briefly, if you can. And, and yeah, yeah, briefer than Luke and I did. So, <laughs> like, if you wanted to hear more of my full thoughts on this, you could find my YouTube channel, which is called Transfigured, and one of my recent videos is me and our mutual friend Luke kind of walking through this, and we took about two hours to get through about sixty or seventy percent of it. So <laughs> I'll do faster than that right now. All right. <laughs> So I'll, I'll read the main, the main chunk and then give some commentary. All right, have, in your relationships with, I'm reading from the NIV. I actually, I'm not going to read from the NIV for yeah, purposes that you, you <laughs> that one won't do me any favors. I'm gonna do the ESV, which is a little bit more um, literal. 
All right, so starting in uh, verse five, have this mind among yourselves, which is uh, yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All right, so what I think is going on here like the whole main context is that Paul is imploring the congregation that he's writing to, to be humble minded as opposed to being selfish, right? That's sort of the verses leading up to this. And this um, many commentators, many translators, interpreters will uh, say is some sort of poem or song, right? I think we all kind of agree on that. He's at least being very poetic, whether or not it was he's quoting from like an early Christian hymn that they already would have known. That's something that's controversial uh, or at least discussed. But anyway, um, what I think this is, the main way that I would understand this is this is talking about how Jesus lived his human earthly incarnate, I won't say incarnate, human earthly fleshly life and using that as an example to inspire the Philippians to live likewise, right? So I think that form of God, so morphe theos, so morphe is the word here for form, and it's a very rare word in the New Testament. I think it's three times, maybe it's like four or five times if you include some of the derivatives from it, but it's a very rare word. And so this is kind of where the essence of the disagreement can lie, is what exactly does form mean? And so I would understand form to mean something like role or authority or sort of the occupation that you're acting out. And the way that I would think that is because it contrasts form of God with form of a servant, right? Servant isn't an inner nature or an essence or something. It's something that you do. It's a position on the hierarchy that you're occupying. And so what I think it's saying is that Jesus was granted by God the Father all, all of this power and all of this wonder working, like Jesus could call on a horde of angels, right? Or legions of angels if he wanted to. But instead of walking around in pomp and circumstance, he was a humble servant, right? That's the contrast. He had this power, but he didn't use it and instead acted like a person who cared about other people more than he cared about himself. And that's exactly what Paul is imploring people to do. Have yourselves in this mind, which is also in Christ Jesus. I'll also point out a lot of Trinitarian theologians will say that Jesus doesn't get named Jesus until he's born, right? The incarnate Jesus is not called Jesus. He is in formal Trinitarian theology often just called the son or, or stuff like that. So it's have this mind in yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus, which should be a hint, I think, that he's talking about the human being which means that he's talking about after birth, right? And so he does all of these things. And so what's the consequence of him doing these things? He then gets exalted by God. And again, it just says God. It's not clarifying which person it is or talking about the Trinity itself or something because he doesn't need to do that. God just means the unipersonal God. And so God exalts him and bestows upon him a name that is above every name. So like what name is Jesus getting bestowed on him? right? What doesn't he already have? And then at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of this is to the glory of God the Father. So I imagine that Jesus is subordinate to God the Father for eternity, and that Jesus is receiving the worship, praise, and adoration of all of everything, but that this is going to him and then sort of rippling up to God sort of like in that reference to 1 Corinthians 15 that, that I made in my opening statement. So I'll stop there. Basically, I think it's something like using the example of Jesus's life of servant leadership to inspire the, uh, the Philippian church to do likewise with respect to the authority and power that they have. Before Chris, before you jump in, I just want to maybe summarize as briefly, just so I understand and maybe for my audience. So you're saying that in verse six, you have, most translations say in the form of God. Uh, the NIV says, who by very nature being God, which is, I don't like that 
<laughs> I don't like that translation. It's taking some liberties. I'll say that. It's picking It's picking the meaning for you. Yeah. E, let's just say that morphe means by the very nature God. Let, that's up to interpretation, not translation. So uh, morphe, he didn't use phusis, a term for nature. He used morphe, which may or may not have to do with nature. So in, who in the form? So you're saying morphe, if I can uh, tell me if you like this, that Jesus here is, let's just say, mediating God's authority on earth, but that isn't inhabiting the very essence of God. Be because, and you say right. because the very word morphe is used in the next verse, that he's the form of the slave. So in the same way, he's sort of occupying the role of a slave. Um, yes. It's not the essence of a slave in the same way that an actual slave would be the essence of a slave. Would, would that be a right, right understanding of what you're saying? With, yeah, with I think the, the incarnational um, interpretation would be much stronger if it used the word physos instead of morphe, right, yeah. which is nature, like right. physiology. That would be more in line with incarnational theology, and it would also be much neater if it paralleled and contrasted more uh, physos of God and physos of man, right? That would be much closer to the way that Trinitarians think that it's sane, but it's different in those two in those two different respects. And I'll also say this: if you're in the form of God, you're not God. If you're not considering equality with God a thing to be grasped, you're not God. God doesn't like, why would you say about God? He didn't, and God didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. That's, that's, you know, that doesn't make any sense. So I think that there's a clear separation between Jesus and God here. And you see that, especially in the second half, when God exalts Jesus and that the glory goes through Jesus to God. So, so that would be the essence of my translation. I could go way more into the weeds, yeah. but I'll refer you to my conversation with Luke. All right, Chris, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, a number of things. First of all, it really is insignificant that he starts by referring to Christ Jesus, because he's talking about Christ Jesus in the present. Christ Jesus in the present, by the time Paul writes this, is incarnate Yahweh. But when he turns to the form of God, he talks about the past tense. So I'm, I'm not, I don't see that as being particularly significant. Um, as for the form of God, I, th I already explained this in my opening. I think one big problem with Sam's reading is that it fails, I think, to account for the way form of God God was used by Paul's contemporary Jews. Um, Sam, you just said a moment ago that if you're in the form of God, you're not God, but that's demonstrably false because you've got people like um, uh, 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 Philo and Josephus both using the form of God to refer to God himself. Uh, Philo says the form of God is not a thing which is capable of being imitated by an inferior one. And you've got Josephus saying God is manifest in his works and benefits, but as to his form and magnitude, he is most obscure. So you've got this language uh, in, in the contemporary Jews to use the form of God to refer to something that is distinctively divine. Uh, and, and to say that instead here means just some sort of uh, office or, or, or authority that's being exercised, I think, fails to do justice to that. Um, now, you based, Sam, your, uh, your reading of form on the fact that he goes on to refer to the form of a servant. And you said a servant doesn't have essential ontology. But being born in the likeness of men is parallel to taking the form of a servant. And human beings are, in fact, by nature, servants to God, um, the God whose nature is to rule. So there is, in fact, an essential ontology to the kind of servant that Paul is here talking about, namely humanity, a human being. Um, the, the second reason I think that Sam's reading doesn't do justice to the text is because, again, contemporary Jews to Paul used equality with God to refer to ontological equality, not some sort of office being held by somebody in God's place or something like that. When uh, John says in John 15 that the Jews think Jesus is making himself equal to God, he goes on to record that they go to kill him because they recognized what Jesus was but doing. They, he says that they were wrong. But, no, actually he doesn't say that. That's, that's an assumption that Unitarians make about that text. But, but we can come back to that when I'm done. Um, so, and then Philos, but, even, but either way, even if he said they were wrong, which he doesn't, but even if he did, he still shows that the Jews understood equality with God to refer to but ontological equality. That's also equality. not, that's not Morphe in that, in that verse. I don't, I don't remember all the No, but it is equality with God. Okay. I, remember, I've moved on from form to okay, equal sorry. with God. 
God. Sorry. That's okay. Sorry. No, that's right. I, I, I want to make sure we distinguish there's form of God and there's a quality with God, which Paul yeah. treats as practically synonymous, and which contemporary Jews used both of those two phrases, form of God and equality with God. And, and my interpretation re- also treats those words as basically synonymous. Right, but they don't, but it doesn't treat them in the way that contemporary Jews to Paul used the language. That's my point. So when you've got contemporary Jews like Philo and Josephus and the Jews that John writes about in John 5.18, all t- collectively using the language of form of God and equality, Quality with God to refer to something that is distinctively and ontologically God, then to say that Paul is using it in an entirely unprecedented way and a way that goes contrary to the way his contemporaries would have used it, I think is a big problem, um, especially since Paul was a thoroughgoingly Jewish Christian. Um, and then I'll just add one more thing. The reason, uh, uh, a third reason, and I mentioned at least four in my opening, for doubting that Sam's reading does just to the text is because Paul says that being born in the likeness of men and taking the form of a servant, which are again parallels, they're the means, they're participles of means. They're the means by which Christ emptied himself. Now you can't empty yourself by becoming a human being. And he doesn't, he doesn't refer to like ordinary humans here, as opposed to say somebody born in, uh, in the royalty. He's just talking about humanity in general. And he says that in order to be, in order to empty yourself by becoming a human, you have to pre-exist your humanity. It's, it's, just sim- it's simply the way that means works. You can't do something by a particular means uh, unless you pre-exist the means. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, for those reasons, and also the historical reasons I gave, namely that Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Origen, and Innovation, they all read the text this way, and those are all uh, late, uh, you know, s- late second century fathers. Um, I, I, I just don't see any reason for thinking that Sam, your reading, uh, does justice to the text. You would basically have to say that Paul is willing to use language in a wholly unprecedented way that goes contrary to the way his contemporaries used it. You would have to believe that that Paul has in mind only a particular kind of human birth, even though he gives no evidence of thinking as much. And you would have to say that that, and you would have to deny, I think anyway, that taking the form of us, that being born in the likeness of men is, a, is the means by which uh, the son emptied himself. And in fact, I think in your very way of reading it, that's exactly what you did. Because if I heard you correctly, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, you said he was in the form of God, but did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself. So, so what you've done, I think, is you've taken the, the break between those two participles and treated that as a break between the first one, which is a participle of means, and the second one, which begins a whole new thought. Now, of course, the Greek doesn't have um, periods and such. And so on mm. the surface of it, that would be plausible. The problem is that the chi, translated and, appears after that second participle. And as far as I can tell, every English translation and Greek critical edition of the New Testament Greek uh, puts the the break in thought either between being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form or even after being found in human form because there's no just there's nothing in the text that would lead you to break up those two participles in the way that I think that you've done anyway I've rambled now for a while so I'll I'll return the (laughs) microphone to you we're getting really technical here in the in the Greek and such and I just want to be sensitive to yeah, sure. Well, no, no, sure. but no, I, I mean, as I, uh, no, I hear you. Absolutely. Says, and yet I, I want to make sure our audience isn't too lost here, but Sam, Sam, do you have any thoughts on what Chris is saying? Um, sure. I mean, I'll say that I think that morphe is, is a rare word, right? And I think it's also rare even in, in the Jewish context. And I think like even our English word form, if you were to look it up in the dictionary, it has a ton of different definitions. And if you just think about the ways that you use it in your regular life, it's a very complicated word. And I know that the English word form and the English word morphe aren't one-to-one the same, but they're kind of close. And so I, I would say that there are as many different interpretations of what morphe means as people that I've talked to about this, if not more so. So I I think that the reason why it seems like Paul is doing something in an unprecedented way is there just aren't a lot of other precedents to compare it to. So if he's using a rare word, then the chances are actually pretty good that it will be unprecedented if it's a multifaceted word, because there are perhaps even more meanings than there are historical references that we could compare it to. So that's why I would say about Morphe. So to kind of uh, move on to 
I, I would actually even say like, so I, I've po I posted my conversation with Luke in the a Biblical Unitarian Facebook group. And I got like three or four different Biblical Unitarian interpretations too. Mine isn't the only one. And also that there's like three or four different Trinitarian interpretations that are also disputed amongst each other. This is one of those verses that's just really hard to understand. It's hard because it uses weird words. It's hard because it's kind of in a song or a poem. Right, like when you're when you're reciting poetry or, or or being you know poetic or something like that, you're more likely to use weird words, and you're more likely to use words in weird ways. I, I would think is sort of part of the nature of poetry itself, because you're stepping outside the bounds of kind of just plain everyday talking. So, so that's one thing that I'd say. Like one biblical Unitarian said, oh, the form of God existing is what he is now, and then it backs up and talks about the past. I'm like, oh, I hadn't totally considered that, but Chris actually kind of alluded to something similar, that form of God actually might be what he is now as opposed to what he was on earth. Another interesting thing, a lot of people like Dale Tuggy will do the parallel and contrast with Adam here, where form of God means image of God. I don't like that because for reasons that Chris has said, there really is no precedent for form being used in the to mean image like that. Icon would be the more typical word. The reason why I think my passage or my interpretation works is because the precedent is within the own passage where form of a servant is something like an occupation. I don't, I think Chris was perhaps stretching it a little bit to connect form of a servant with the essence of humanity. I didn't, I'll just say that I didn't find that entirely convincing. And I think that, I don't know, I'm not going to parse the Greek grammar because I'm not as good at that as you guys are. But it seems to me kind of because it's a poem, you can chop up the clauses. And I think being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, honestly, I'm not entirely sure why that's in there. I do see the Trinity or the incarnational point that it seems like a sequence, right? It seems like empties himself and then born in the likeness of men. I can see how it seems like chronology. That, that, just but, to be clear though, that's not, we're not saying it's chronology. That's, that's why and, I said- and, and the clauses of the and, and and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, I, well specifically the, the participles of means is, is contemporaneous. It's not chronological, right? It's, it's by being born in the likeness of men that Paul says Christ emptied himself. I, I still think that, that, that that's going, yeah, go Chris, press him. From a Greek standpoint, though, I mean, saying it's a participle of means, that is an interpretive decision. It's not like there's something intrinsic to the actual Greek apart from interpretation that means it's a participle of means. Like that is a grammatical interpretive category, right? That's true. However, um, number one, as far as I know, everybody agrees that the first of those two participles is a participle of means. Uh, and number two, whatever whatever category of of participle you want to say that is it 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 is the same tense as the aorist verb emptied himself and generally not always but generally when you've got an aorist participle adverb adverbially modifying a aorist verb an aorist indicative verb as is the case here those are contemporaneous it's not chronological so what you've got is so i think what we're forced to say if we want to be true to the text, is that whatever whatever the whatever the whatever the category of mean of participle it is means purpose reason uh, simple temporal contemporaneousness whatever either way those two things are happening at the same time in being born in the likeness of men Christ emptied himself that can't work in a Unitarian reading. That's my contention. And that's why I said the only way I think that Sam's reading of this can, can be held up is if you split those two participles. So you've got emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and those two things are happening at the same time. And then you leave a big pause and you begin with being born in the likeness of men. But that's but that's contrary to all the English translations. It's contrary to the, the Greek critical editions of the Greek New Testament. And there's really no justifiable reason for putting the break there unless you want to find it there. That's my contention anyway. No, that's fair. Well, that's, that's good. sure. I mean, I would say, look, I, I'm not going to be able to compete with you on, on Greek splicing. And so I, I won't be able to get into the weeds with you on that. I, I would just say kind of at the highest level that I think that it's mentioning Jesus's humanity to further highlight his humility. And that I don't think it's trying to communicate 
the way in which he emptied himself, but is communicating about how that we can relate to him. Well, well, let me push back on you on that, Sam, because you said something really important. You said that Paul is trying to connect his humanity with his humility. How is anybody humble? How does anybody make a choice to be humble simply by being human? Well, I'm saying that the example is that we can relate to his humility through his humanity. Sorry, I okay. maybe well, we can... led, I, 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 I'll, that's really what I meant. Understood, understood. But, but and, and this is something that you, I think, briefly mentioned in your conversation with Luke, and Dale Tuggy presses it even more. So I, I don't want to just, I, I don't want to assume that you are particularly guilty of this. I'll just say Dale is particularly guilty of this, saying that it would make no sense for Paul to offer Christ as an example of humility if what he's talking about is his incarnation, because no human being can relate to giving up one's divine nature in order to become human. But that's utterly irrelevant, because what you can, what humans can relate to, is treating equals as if they're our superiors, right? Um, my my boss is ontologically my superior, or let's put it this way. My wife is both ontologically and relationally my equal. Um, if, if egalitarianism is true and if complementarianism is true, at least we're still ontologically equal, right? But, but when I treat her as my superior, that is taking somebody who's my equal and treating them as my superior. And I think that's exactly what Paul is saying here in Philippians 2. God, the son, though he enjoyed equality with God, existing in the form of God, submitted himself to the father. So he's, he's, he's treating an equal as if he's a superior. And that is, in fact, something that we human beings can easily relate to, just not on the divine human level, more on you know, uh, the, the human to human level. So but couldn't he treat his um, ontological equal as a superior without incarnating himself? I don't. I don't yeah, but I don't think that would be humility. That's that's what I'm saying. It's not humble to treat somebody who's ontologically superior to you as your superior. That's just common sense. You're all you're doing is doing what you're supposed to do. Right. right. Well, that's you, not what that's not the way that I interpret it. I'm saying that Jesus had the ability to be a selfish empowered leader, but mm -hmm. instead acted as a selflessly other focused servant leader. And that's the, that's what I think the example of humility is. And that I think you would agree is an example of humility. I, I would agree. The problem is Jesus isn't obeying any human being by humbly submitting himself to death. Yeah, but he's right? obeying what, what is, God, which kind of exactly. speaks, to, which speaks the, to my point. But well, well but it doesn't, anyway. because because we both believe that the Father's God and that Jesus is here submitting to God. The but what isn't humble is obeying the one to whom you're obligated to obey, right? To well, obey, it to could be have obedient. Been, Jesus could have been disobedient, though, right? And right. he could have tried to usurp his father. Sure. And that would have been disobedient. And I think that's also sort of what's being communicated here is that Jesus, not only did he not like use his power for, you know, selfishness, but he also didn't try and usurp him either. I but think that's, that's not, but, but and, right. I understand. And what I'm arguing and what a lot of Trinitarians argue is that what you isn't an example of humility. That's just an example of not being dumb, right? Not, well, not trying to usurp Kind of, a, yes. I mean, right. well, Satan certainly did the opposite, right? And Adam did the opposite. And but, I do sometimes think having some amount of, of Adamness to understanding, like a parallel and contrast with Adam is a little bit okay. But. Well, the problem, of course, as you know, is that there's no precedent whatsoever for using this language to describe Adam. So I, I, I'm, I'm not going to go with you there, but that's okay because I could be wrong. I think a even a things. Trinitarian could be okay with that, but you know. Anyways. They could, they just would have a vacation for doing so. Okay. So, so but, but going back to this issue of humility, all I'm saying is if Satan had not um, tried to use authority of God, etc. That wouldn't have made him humble. That would have just made him rational. That's what I argue here, and that's what we Trinitarians well, often humble, argue about. Humility and irrationality aren't, or humility and rationality aren't mutually ex exclusive. But right? they're also I not don't, synonymous. They're not synonymous. But I don't think Paul thinks it's irrational to be humble here, right? I don't, I don't either. But it, I do it's sort think... of it's both. But like I. I'm a little bit confused because you seem to be trying to tell me that my in interpretation doesn't show Jesus as being humble, but I thought we already kind of agreed that it does. I'm saying it doesn't show him to be humble to the one whom the text says he is humble toward. 
Well, he's also obedient to God. I don't see how that's mutually right. exclusive with my reading. Because, it's, because it's, it's like both of those things at the same time. Yeah, but, but humility is not demonstrated in obeying an ontological superior. That's what I I'm think saying. It, I think it is. Okay, I, well, I think that's obviously so, a place where we disagree. If a sergeant obeys his general, he's both being rational and he's being humble. Well, number one, a general isn't ontologically superior to a sergeant. God is ontologically superior to a creature. And so being obedient to the creator is being rational. I don't know that I would consider that humble. You might, and that's okay. But that's, Well, that's I know that... some arrogant atheists that I'll point you to, to show you people who think that they can be arrogantly superior to their creator. And I would say they're not being humble, whereas a good Christian is humble to God and he is our ontological sure. superior. So, so, so again, I don't, I'm not quite sure exactly where you're going with this. That's fine. But So I'll just reiterate the points I made in my opening. Number one, form of God and equality of God are both phrases, uh, uh, terms, idioms, whatever, that contemporary Jews use to refer to God alone. So already, it's not just that Paul would be doing something unprecedented with that language by using it to describe a creature. More than that, he would be using language that already to God's being and using it to refer to somebody who is definitionally ontologically not God. That's, that's taking it to a whole other level. Number two, these, these participles are the, are the, there's no indication here that he's talking about a particular kind of human, like a low man, an ordinary human, as opposed to a, a, somebody born in a lap of luxury. He's just about human humanity, full stop, coming human. And number three, he says becoming human is the at the very least, contemporaneous with his emptying himself. So the only way to make sense of this passage consistently, at least if you want to deal with the original language, is to affirm that Christ preexisted his incarnation. Hey, guys. Um, <laughs> I know, we're already like two hours. I got, I got my dinner. I could smell my dinner upstairs just waiting for me, and we're over two hours. Um, uh, Sam, uh, why don't you, uh, can you, can you maybe give one more response to Chris's last statement? He kind of summed up his view. Sure. He articulated at the beginning, he kind of summed it up. Do you want to give us maybe a 30 second summary of what, what you're saying yeah. about this, this passage in particular, and then I'll close this out. Sure. So in Matthew 20, um, the, the mother of the sons of Deb Zebedee asks if, you know, her sons can say his left and right hand. And Jesus, you know, rebukes him saying that it's not his to give, which is an interesting thing for God to say. But then Jesus says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is talking about how Jesus lived his life on earth. And I think you can already hear the parallels and commonalities between that passage and Philippians 2. And I think that's the right way to understand what's going on here. Paul's encouraging us to imitate the way Jesus lived his life. I want to thank you both for being on the podcast. Um, I, I love just the balance of, I think, grace and also forthrightness. I think you guys both raised lots of great points and and uh, just appreciate both your postures. And, um, you know, Sam, you said you didn't have any formal theological training. You're, <laughs> you don't show any evidence of that lack. That's yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, the fact that you oh, read like Ignatius, you know, in your spare time and think through, you know, uh, Anselm or whoever else, Aquinas. And it, like, I just really appreciate um, your thoughtfulness and, and desire to really think through these things. And Chris, I mean, we go a long ways back. Thank you so much for um, it's the same thing. I mean, you're just your thoroughness and a lot of the stuff you said was off the cuff. I, you know, this wasn't scripted apart from the first few minutes or whatever. Um, but you, <laughs> well, both of us, both Sam and I have at least a little bit of practice in this yeah, arena. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's <true. laughs> um, but thank you guys so much for being on the podcast. And uh, yeah, um, you've, you've challenged my thinking. I hope you challenged uh, lots of other people's thinking uh, out there in cyberspace somewhere. Well, thanks for having me on. And, and thank you, Sam, for a great discussion. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, no, thank you very much to both of you, especially press. I'm really thankful that you risked to talk about this topic because I know a lot of people want it. And Chris, I really appreciate your time and your earnest engagement on these topics. I can tell that you put in time and thoughtful effort into that. And, and I really appreciate it. And I'll, I'll think about the things that you said. Uh, and likewise, I'll think about yours as well. We'll see you next time on Theology in the Raw.